Or I can just let it, oh, this meeting's been, okay. All right. So just as people keep trickling in, I think we'll get started. Hi everyone, my name's Hannah, I'm one of the PBAX um, co-chairs with Rachel. Um, thank you all so much for coming tonight. We've got a, um, a final part to our ICU mini series um, on intracranial hemorrhage. And we'll be hearing from um, Dr. Laura Chudley um, shortly. Um, tonight, we're hoping to spend about an hour focusing on subarachnoid hemorrhages and intracranial hypertension. Um, and we've also got time for questions at the end. Um, as always, we'll be using Slido. Um, we'll post that link in the chat um, in a bit. So if you have any questions, do feel free to send them through there. Um, or otherwise you can type them in the chat and we can also read them out, but it is probably better if you use the Slido. Um, our sponsors tonight, we actually have two sponsors tonight. So we have Avant Mutual um, and we'll hear from Peter and then we'll also hear from Nicole from Dr. On Call. So Peter, I'll pause my screen sharing if you'd like to share your screen. Perfect. Is that coming through? That is, yeah. Excellent. Thanks, everyone. My name is Peter Lambert at Avant. Thanks to Hannah and Steph for the opportunity to talk tonight. I've only got a couple of minutes, so I will speak very, very fast. And I'd also ask that um, there's QR codes, but please just have your mobile phone handy so you can just take a snapshot of the screen because I appreciate you probably, you know, you've got a, you're meeting straight after this. So why do more doctors choose Avant? Screen has just frozen. Can you see that? Frozen. Oh no. There you go. Can you see that now? Yeah, that's perfect. Good. Okay. So, what is that MDO? You, you, some of you obviously already with a band, but really an MDO is about protecting its members' ability to practice medicine and also to cover you with medico legal support. So what we do is we cover you for compensation claims, legal fees for disciplinary, coronial and criminal proceedings, and perhaps investig investigations like APRA or hospital inquiries. Our vision is to be a trusted protector and advisor for our members, professionally and personally, so you can focus on practicing good medicine and achieve your goals. So who is Avant? Again, I'm sure you're, a lot of you are aware of us, we're the largest MDO, we represent more than 79,000 doctors and students across the country. We also have the largest uh, medico legal team uh, called Avant Law, which I'll touch on in a bit more detail. So support when you most need it. Well, obviously embarking on your first years as a doctor is absolutely exciting, but can also be very daunting and stressful. The chances are, and whilst we don't want any of these things to happen, the chances are something will go wrong with the management of one of your patients one day. And irrespective of whether it's your fault or not, the indemnity insurance that your hospital or university provides may not be sufficient to cover you in all the circumstances. And that's why our members rely on us. So it's important to have your own medical indemnity cover to obtain independent advice and support. As I touched on earlier, it could be complaints to, from the medical board, coronial inquiries, employment or training disputes. These are the most common problems that we hear on our medical legal advice line from our junior doctor members. So I touched on this earlier. This is, yeah, whilst I think I do a great job, this Avant Law team is really the backbone of Avant. They really make the difference. Joining, being an Avant member, you're backed by Avant Law, which is the largest in-house medico-legal firm in Australia. You're talking over 70 specialist medico-legal solicitors right across the country. Now, this is particularly useful if you are you know, on your medical journey moving from state to state, you can be ensure that you, you're backed by the largest medico-legal team with Avant. Advocacy is also really, really important event. We take it very, very seriously, negotiating with key stakeholders like government, particularly you look at the most recent situations like you know, we're advocating for the no fault COVID-19 indemnity scheme, voluntary assisted dying, and also more recently changes to APRA's investigation process to make sure it's fair and timely. So these are things that we do also on behalf of our members. 
Again, uh, whip out the phone and just take a snapshot of this because I know, I know you don't have time to look at it now, but I really, really encourage you to please have a look at our Vant Learning Centre. There's just so much information, particularly for the junior doctor cohort, treating family and friends, use of social media, particularly such things like Snapchat, how to obtain informed consent. I uh, really would encourage you to revisit all the information on our website. It really is useful. Avant, more than just insurance, we uh, also provide the Avant Doctor in Training Research Scholarship Program. Again, we've got our specialist me medical legal advisors. You can call us 24 seven, uh, as well as uh, things like Doctors Health Fund. There's so many more things to Avant rather than just being a medical insurance organization. Again, there's our, uh, if you are a student and you're not with us yet, uh, I'm not expecting you to you know, join right now, but please take a photo and revisit us later on. Same if you're an intern RMO, we've actually got the free light extras cover from Doctors Health Fund, which is part of Avant. So I really would encourage you to take advantage of that if you're an intern or RMO and perhaps not with Avant. Lastly, I just want to share this, Avant Foundation Early Career Research Program just recently been launched where we're offering grants for pre-vocational accredited trainees for up to 50,000 and micro grants of up to 5,000. Again, just take a snapshot of the screen, revisit it later on this evening or throughout the week. And if you want more information, it's all on our website. That is it from me. I hope I haven't gone over five minutes. Thank you again, Hannah and Steph. Really appreciate the opportunity. Happy to take any questions. Otherwise, happy Hannah, if you want to, or Steph, loop back to me uh, tomorrow. Happy to do that also. Thanks, Peter. Did anybody have any questions, Peter? Otherwise, we might move on to Nicole. Thank you so much, Peter. Thank you. Really the rest of your meeting. See you. Bye-bye. So, Nicole, I'll hand over to you. Yeah, beautiful. Okay, so my name's Nicole. I'm the general manager of Dr. On Call Medical Locum Agency. Um, so just a little bit about Dr. On Call. Dr. On Call has been placing doctors in public and private hospitals uh, throughout Australia since 2007. Our locum agency is owned by three doctors. We have an anaesthetist director, we have a radiologist director, and we have a FASM director. So we've been in the medical industry for quite some time um, with our doctors off practicing in their own fields of choice. Um, so unlike the name, lots of people think that uh, we're a home visit service. We're not, we're actually a locum agency for doctors that places doctors in hospitals. Um, we also have a few other things uh, like events and um, basically anywhere that requires a doctor other than um, in the home. Um, so that's a little bit about doctor on call um things that we offer so with our agency we offer accommodation and travel um, we do all the negotiations on your behalf for shift times um, pay rates um, that sort of thing so so the agency looks after that we have two consultants so one that looks after our private hospital division and one that looks after our public hospital division um, and then we also have a team that um, you know our financial control that looks after um, the invoicing and, and paying you for your shifts. And then we also have an admin admin team that can help out with paperwork. Um, so that's a little bit about us. Benefits we do offer. We do have two incentive programs with Dr. On Call. Um, so when you first register up, you can go on to what's called our performance boost. So if for every five shifts you work, you get $400. Um, for every 10 shifts you work, you get another $200. And for an extra five shifts, you get another $100. So basically, when you sign up with Doctor On Call and you work your first 15 shifts, um, you'll get back as a performance boost of $700. There are a few terms and conditions with that, um, but basically, yeah, if you, if you sort of sign up, do your shifts without cancellation, um, there's a little bit of a bonus performance boost in there. Um, so there are a couple of benefits about being a, a, a locum with Doctor On Call. Um, uh, we've also got a refer a doctor program. So if you have any friends that are interested in locuming and you wish to refer them, um, once a, ref a referral is received and once they work their first shift, um, you as the referrer will get a $500 gift voucher. So there are quite a few little um, benefits there with doctor on call um, and, and locum work. Um, we do, there is a scan code um, that Hannah has in the presentation, I think towards the end, 
it's quite easy. You just need to scan the code um, and then put in your details. And then one of our team members will be in touch um, about the registration process. It is quite easy. Um, you're not signing your life away by registering. Um, all we need for you to register to, to sign up initially is a current CV and then three referee details. Um, so if anyone is interested in locum work, um, please have a look at Doctor On Call. Um, we have a lot of contracts. We have a lot of exclusive contracts um, with hospitals around Australia, um, and we know what we're doing. We've been there. We've been there a while, and um, and we're available twenty four seven to assist with onboarding and shift times and you know um, placements. So. So that's pretty much us. We do have a website if you want to have a look at our website. It's quite easy. It's www.doctoroncall.com.au and the doctor is a DR. Um, but yeah, so if anyone has any questions, um, let me know. Otherwise, I'll, I'll leave you to, your, to your webinar. Amazing. Thank you so much, Nicole. Thanks, Hannah. If nobody has any pressing questions, um, I think we will move on um, and just a reminder to everyone these um, every thing that PVAX puts out online is recorded and put up on our YouTube channel um, which you can find by going to pvax.org or via our Facebook page um, and now without further ado I think we'll move on to our presentation tonight from Dr Laura Chudley who's an advanced trainee working at Monash um, when Laura's not studying for her fellowships exams, she's enjoying running and cycling, as well as being a plant lover. I can see one in the background there, Laura. <laughs> You're doing well. <laughs> um, and just a reminder to everyone that we will be asking questions through Slido. So please, please ask questions as much as you'd like through there. Um, so Laura, I'll stop my screen share and allow you to share your screen if you'd like. All right. Thanks, Anna. No problem. Um, is that coming through? That is, yeah, that's working. Okay, great. So thanks for the introduction and um, that very ordinary photo <laughs> from work. Um, so I've been asked to talk about intracranial hemorrhage and raised ICP in ICU. Um, there are many different ways that you can bleed into the brain, as I'm sure you all remember from medical school. Um, so it's going to be, I'm going to focus on two case studies tonight. We'll, have, we'll talk a little bit about intracranial hemorrhage risk factors in presentation. We'll do two case studies, one on intracerebral hemorrhage and one on subarachnoid hemorrhage. And then we'll talk about um, a more ICU flavour um, of... Um, management of these patients. Um, most of our role in intensive care is prevention of any secondary brain injury. And my focus tonight will be on uh, raised intracranial pressure. So what kinds of bleeds are there? I'm sure everyone remembers this, but just as a reminder, you can have a traumatic bleed or a spontaneous bleed. Uh, in terms of traumatic bleed, bleeds, the most common are extra drill down here. You've got that um, classic uh, convexity there. Subdural hemorrhage, which may be traumatic or atraumatic. You can have either type. Um, so risk factors, for example, include old age um, and falls. Even without a head strike, you can still end up with a subdural hematoma, um, particularly if there's a small brain in there from age or even alcohol misuse with cerebral um, atrophy. You'll, you can end up with tearing of the, um, of the subdural uh, veins resulting in a significant subdural hematoma. Um, contusions can occur, so coup and contra coup injuries with acceleration and deceleration in trauma um, are also common and very difficult to manage and result in diffuse cerebral edema as well as um, many micro hemorrhages throughout the brain. Um, spontaneous intracranial hemorrhage, so you can have spontaneous intracerebral hemorrhage. So this image taken from the BMJ essentially just has a more superficial one, the deeper one here in the, um, in the deep subcortical um, white matter structures um, that can be quite problematic and have quite a uh, devastating effect um, in terms of neurology. And then of course, subarachnoid hemorrhage, which we will get to as well tonight. So risk factors, there are so many. 
Um, and we see, I have seen all of these. Um, so hypertension and your standard cardiovascular risk factors, of course, will result in, it can result in intracranial hemorrhage. Drugs, don't ever forget sympathomimetics. So your young person that is apparently off their face in the emergency department can actually have an intracerebral hemorrhage from um, sympathomimetic um, toxidrome and ending up with uh, malignant hypertension, which I have seen. So if, if someone, if you notice that someone's not moving one side of their body, for example, that's a very good indication for a CT brain and not just to put it down to um, the drug toxidrome itself. Anticoagulants are really common in our older population. So many more patients getting anticoagulated for valves, so um, valve re replacements or um, atrial fibrillation, for example, um, and DVT-PE can end up with intracranial hemorrhage. Thrombolysis, this is something that's quite niche and something um, that you will see if you thrombolyze ischemic strokes, you can have secondary transformation of, um, of ischemic stroke, but you can also, for example, we had a lady recently who has had who's presented with massive PE, arrested, received thrombolysis in the emergency department. These patients are a really high risk of um, of intracranial hemorrhage. One of the um, one of the contraindications to thrombolysis is, of course, a known intracranial. Um, in abnormality, particularly in ABM, but you do not have time to put your patient through the scanner um, when they're arrested from a PE. And alcohol, either from falls and alcoholic liver disease resulting in low platelets and an elevated INR, or um, as I said earlier, even just from atrophy resulting in a subdural hemorrhage. Congenital abnormalities, for example, moya moya, is not an exhaustive list, by the way. So that's uh, congenital abnormalities with the with the um, uh, the arterial system in the brain, which um, weaken the walls in a similar manner to cerebral amyloid angiopathy. Uh, moya moya will essentially can cause ischemia. I guess more common than bleeding, but it can result in bleeding. Um, AVMs or just subarachnoid aneurysms that are likely to pop. Vasculitides can cause uh, atraumatic subarachnoid hemorrhage. Tumors, so the primary or metastatic disease, these can be really difficult sometimes um, to determine on a plain CT whether or not it's just a de novo bleed in the intracerebral parenchyma or whether or not there's actually an underlying metastasis. And then um, pregnancy and eclampsia. So eclampsia can result in significant hypertension. And part of the eclamptic syndrome is actually DIC, which can also predispose you to intracranial hemorrhage. Um, so presentation, um, everyone knows it, but nausea, vomiting, altered conscious state, headache, focal neurology, they're the kinds of things that people come to the emergency department with. They often come with a, um, a headache that's been going for a couple of days and they might've had a herald bleed, particularly in subarachnoid hemorrhage. Um, but not always. It can just be bang, devastating GCS3 in the emergency department um, after headache in the afternoon, resulting in a devastating intracranial hemorrhage. Signs. Uh, this picture down here is third nerve palsy. I don't think I appreciated um, potentially until I was training, actually, that you can have a complete or partial third nerve palsy. So this is a complete third nerve palsy. So you've got down and out, but you've also got this fixed dilated pupil here. So we spend a lot of time in ICU thinking about fixed dilated pupils. When you have a patient that's intubated and ventilated, you are keeping them sedated to ensure that they've got comfort from the tube perspective and, and safety uh, for the patient in receiving um, life supports in intensive care, but they can, um, it can be difficult to determine if a patient's had an intracranial event, you have to have a very low index of suspicion. Um, and we do wean sedation, um, but it can be difficult to determine who's got delirium, who's got focal neurology. So eye signs are really important. Polyuria, it's another thing that we think about and we see in ICU all the time. Um, so polyuria from diabetes insipidus, uh, so more than 300 mils an hour for a few hours and a rising sodium should really have you thinking about polyuria, uh, polyuria and um, diabetes insipidus from raised intracranial pressure. Cushing's response, this is um, when it happens, you've got no doubt that it's happening, okay? So bradycardia, we had a patient recently in the emergency department, heart rate was 20, 
blood pressure was 220 and then they have irregular respiration. So they're agonally breathing. So there's never any doubt about a Cushing's response. Sometimes you might see elderly patients with hypertension that are beta blocked, but it's never this profound and they rarely ever have the um, altered conscious state to go with it. Um, nystagmus, uh, diplopia, um, more subtle eye signs you have to worry about posterior fossa, um, uh, intracranial hemorrhage. So you'd be thinking about what's going on in the cerebellum if they've got eye signs or even the brainstem if you've got something like a lateral medullary syndrome, but they will also have more often than not focal neurology or at least gait ataxia um, as part of their presenting complaint. And they, they don't typically have um, such a depressed conscious state. And of course, papilledema. Um, this is something everyone should do during an emergency department term. I certainly did not look at enough eyes when I was in the emergency and we certainly don't spend a lot of time looking and doing fundoscopy in ICU. We have a pretty low threshold just to get a scan. So what are the complications of intracranial hemorrhage? There are, if you can think about it, it happens. Um, this is just a, a potted list. Um, focal neurology, obviously, with stroke-specific syndromes, which will help you with your neuroanatomy determine where the stroke has happened. Seizures, including non-convulsive status epilepticus. This is something that we think about in ICU all the time. If you have a patient in ICU and they've had any intracranial event or even without an intracranial event and you wake and you turn the sedation off and they won't wake up, you have to think, is this non-convulsive status epilepticus? This down here is an image of an EEG. I can't interpret this EEG. Okay, that's what we need our neurology colleagues for. But essentially, brain waves, um, you, you just check the brain waves. That's all I have to say about um, EEGs. In ICU, I can recognize like one pattern and it's burst suppression. It's when we put patients into a, essentially um, a coma to try and suppress all the electrical activity in the brain. That's like the only time that you want to see electrical asystole. So asystole of the brain is good in ICU if you're trying to suppress um, non-convulsive status epilepticus. Diabetes insipidus we've talked about. People can get really dehydrated with diabetes insipidus. You have to work pretty hard to chase that fluid. Um, and you have to think about using something like 5% dextrose to ensure that the sodium's not climbing too high. Raised ICP, we'll get to later. Um, other um, stroke-specific syndrome, so locked-in syndrome. Locked-in syndrome is really hard to identify. The thing that will get it for you is that a patient can blink their eyes in response uh, to questions, and they will be able to do horizontal movements of the eyes. That's it. They are awake. They are conscious. Um, they have a normal sleep-wake cycle, um, but they will not be able to move anything else. So that's something to keep in the back of your mind. Um, brain death and herniation syndromes as well. Um, this is an image showing all the different places a brain can herniate. So it's not just trans, um, transtentorial uh, cerebellar tonsillar herniation. So down the foramen magnum down here, you can get very multiple varying different kinds. So transcalvarial, obviously this is traumatic or if a patient is in theatre, this is not actually uncommon. If a patient's had a massive subarachnoid hemorrhage and the neurosurgeons take them to theatre to put in extra um, external ventricular drains, um, when they do a durotomy, so when they cut through the bone and then cut through the dura, if the pressure is really high, sometimes brain, can, brain tissue can herniate out the durotomy site. Um, other um, sites of... Um, um, herniation essentially just underneath anytime you um, there's a reflection of the of the um, uh, meninges in the brain so the uh, folk cerebri um, and the cerebellum um, tentorum here so you can have uncle herniation down here of the um, medial aspect of the tem temporal load lobe and this this will manifest the, the subphalcine midline shift that you'll see midline shift essentially on the CT yeah 
You can get hydrocephalus as well. So that's essentially swelling of the um, intraventricular system. So the fluid filled spaces in the brain and hypertension. Complications aren't just limited to the brain. So we spend a lot of time managing these other conditions uh, in ICU. So cardiovascular arrhythmias are quite common. This image down here is of a patient who is thankfully intubated. This line here is the endotracheal tube. Um, and you've got significant uh, alveolar opacifications bilaterally um, in an otherwise normal uh, it's a patient with normal looking lung parenchyma. You can also see some curly B lines over here. So this fluid in the fissure, um, which, and you've, there's loss here of this um, diaphragm on the right hand side. So this is neurogenic pulmonary edema. What makes it different from any other pulmonary edema is essentially the context in which you're in. So the mechanism of neurogenic pulmonary edema, it's pretty unclear, but essentially, um, it's thought to be increased um, pressure on this um, sympathetic autonomic system uh, centers in the brain stem, um, resulting in a catecholamine surge. So you get constriction of the veins um, and increased venous return to the right heart at the same time. So that's increased preload. And at the same time, you get constriction of the blood vessels, um, the arterial system, backed up against the left ventricle. So the left ventricle is pumping against really tight tubes. And then eventually you can end up with pulmonary edema that way. So it's a combination of factors. And there's also some increased capillary hydrostatic pressure resulting in um, acute pulmonary edema, uh, which is obviously a medical emergency where uh, it's a bit easier for us to manage when the patient already has a breathing tube in. So along with those mechanisms that I've already mentioned, you might have heart failure. Um, and I guess the commonest kind would be a Takatsugo's kind of syndrome, where you have uh, apical ballooning of the left ventricle and a really tight, um, I guess, uh, base of the left ventricle. It's a very characteristic pattern and patients go into acute pulmonary edema with acute left ventricular failure from Takatsugo's cardiomyopathy, usually reversible. Um, so patients aspirate as well from a respiratory perspective uh, when they drop their conscious state and may, may develop ARDS, uh, so um, acute respiratory distress syndrome, which we see a lot of in ICU um, as a result of being crit critically unwell. Um, hyperglycemia, incredibly common part of the stress response, part of the sympathetic overdrive of what's going on for these patients. And renal failure, um, actually typically uh, dehydration from hyperglycemia and um, diabetes insipidus is, is a classical mechanism of renal failure for these patients. So I want to talk about a case. This is a hybrid case based on a recent case that I had um, not that long ago, a few weeks ago, actually. So this is a 30-year-old lady. She's G1. P1, 32 weeks pregnant, admitted to emergency department with headache, uh, went to the emergency department with headache and admitted under ONG's management of hypertension. She had not received any antenatal care in the community. So she's admitted to the ward. She started on some oral antihypertensive therapy. The obstetrics and gynecology registrar gives you a ring and asks you to consult. Um, because the patient still has really difficult to manage blood pressure on the ward, despite all the things that they have to offer. And he gives you a ring and says, can you come and have a look at the patient to see if you'll, you think she needs to go to ICU? You get there and she has a seizure. Um, management, you manage the seizure. So management of um, an eclamptic seizure. So this lady has presented to emergency department with preeclampsia and then um, manifested into eclampsia by dint of the fact that she's had a seizure. So you manage the seizure with a loading dose of magnesium, it's 20 millimoles of magnesium over 10 to 15 minutes and then the same amount hourly. The ONG guys like to talk in grams, they like to talk four, five, six grams and that's roughly 20 millimoles for the rest of us who are prescribing in millimoles. You get an adequate GCS following this um, and you really want to go to theatre because the patient is 
pregnant and has eclampsia and the only management for that, definitive management for that is delivery of the fetus. Um, but you go to ICU first for um, ongoing management while you prepare um, to go to theatre. In ICU, her systolic blood pressure is still 180. And her heart rate's 100. Stats are okay, 98% on room air. But her GCS is 12. She's E3, V4, M5. Um, and you're just thinking, uh, she's not really postictal still. What's going on? Luckily, you thought about it and you did a CT brain on the way out to ICU. And this is the scan. As you can see, this is an axial cross section of the brain. And we've got quite a large um, intracerebral uh, intraparenchymal hemorrhage that really um, actually correlates with the um, subcortical white matter uh, structures so around near the um, putamen. You do some bloods because the patients come to ICU, you put an arterial line in and send off a set of bloods. Hemoglobin's 100 and her clotting is wildly abnormal. She's got platelets of 50, an APTT of 70. Um, so that's twice the upper limit of normal. Fibrinogen is only 0.3 in an obstetric patient. It's very, very low. Um, and her INR is 5.2. And you've sent a D-dimer and it's 68. And you've sent a D-dimer um, for those who aren't aware, um, not because you're worried that this lady has PE, but because you're worried that she in fact has DIC, so diffused uh, intravascular coagulation. Um, and this is a classical DIC picture right here, and it can be associated with eclampsia. So this lady's had a hypertensive hemorrhage um, that she was, I guess, at increased risk of hemorrhage because of her abnormal clotting profile. So what next? In ICU, we like to think about specific management and then we think about our supportive management. So in terms of specific management, as I've already mentioned, specific management is delivery of the baby. Um, in order to achieve the best outcome for this woman, we really need a multidisciplinary approach. It's no longer just ONG, it's ONG and the ICU. And actually now it's neurosurgery as well because she's had this intracranial event. So you need to continue to manage any ongoing seizures. The natural history of these um, eclamptic seizures, thankfully, is typically that they self-terminate, that they're generalised chronic, tonic, tonic, chronic seizures, sorry. So you can, you can see them, they're very obvious. Um, and magnesium usually does the trick, um, but your next line is standard. Okay, everything else that you would usually do for seizures, you can also do. So benzodiazepines, um, would be your next line for um, uh, the termination of seizures if you haven't got there with magnesium. And you would continue that magnesium infusion and your target of magnesium is actually a serum level of 2.5 to like 3.5. You're not really running into magnesium toxicity until you're greater than four. And realistically, you're not running into really terrible um, toxicity until you're greater than seven. Okay, so respiratory depression usually happens at a serum magnesium level of about seven. So you've got a lot of room to move. Blood pressure. Blood pressure targets in intracranial hemorrhage are really important. Um, this is talk about intracranial hemorrhage, not preeclampsia. This is just war eclampsia. This is just an interesting case that's happened recently, which is why we're talking about it. Um, Blood pressure targets are really something that you spend a lot of time liaising with neurosurgery about, and they can be, um, uh, there can be a lot of variation in practice. Uh, in ICU, I guess the way that we manage patients is one of two ways typically. What's the evidence base? We spend a lot of time talking about um, evidence in ICU. And if we don't have evidence, we are doing our best to maintain normal physiology and manipulate physiology trying to return it to as normal as possible. So if a patient's had a hypertensive bleed, the systolic target is usually less than 140 millimetres of mercury. Um, that's based on not a whole bunch of very excellent evidence. Um, there's a few studies, a few head-to-head -head studies that have shown the difference between 140 and one, um, 180 systolic. It's marginal at best whether or not there is a mortality benefit, but 
I guess the major societies um, would have that as their recommendation. And so that's really standard, mostly standard practice um, for a patient that's had a hypertensive bleed um, is less than 140 systolic. This lady has wildly um, off the tree clotting. So you're gonna manage her clotting, you're gonna medically manage her clotting in order to prevent any further risk of extension of that hypertensive bleed. And so that means a whole lot of products. Um, what the targets are really depend on the target population. This lady's going to surgery. Um, she's gonna have an emergency cesarean section to deliver that baby. Um, and so you are going to need to be pretty aggressive about um, achieving some normal clotting parameters. Of note in the um, pregnant obstetric population, it's um, ideal to add, uh, aim for a fibrinogen that's quite high, so greater than 2.0. They're usually at the end of pregnancy are normally cl closer to the end of four anyway, but you need to replace the clotting factors for this lady. Um, targets for hemoglobin are a lot higher in traumatic brain injury. So we often extrapolate um, from, from that kind of research, they often say uh, hemoglobin greater than 100 if you've had um, a neurosurgical procedure particularly. Um, classically, we would otherwise only ever target greater than 70 hemoglobin or greater than 80 if, if the patient um, has active ischemic heart disease. Other specific management for this lady, you're going to um, monitor and deliver the baby. So you need a CTG on the mum's um, belly while you're preparing for theatre. This lady's had a bleed, so you're going to contact uh, and liaise with neurosurgery. Um, not a neurosurgeon, um, but it's doubtful that they would operate in, in, a, in an isolated, deep structure, uh, intracranial hemorrhage. If it's very large and it's very superficial in the cortex, they might think about it. But otherwise, these kinds of bleeds tend to be conservatively managed. And so really, that's you in ICU keeping a really close eye on their neurological state um, if they're intubated or otherwise, um, and uh, keeping good control of that blood pressure. And then in ICU, the supportive things. Um, so routine post-operative care and housekeeping. Um, Got some really terrible pictures in this presentation. I apologise, but this is this is scuds, so sequential compression devices, the lower limbs. Uh, we spend a lot of our time after a neurosurgeon has operated on a patient, or after a patient's had um, an intracranial hemorrhage, saying, "Can we start DVT prophylaxis yet? Can we start DVT prophylaxis yet?" And so when we say that, you can have mechanical or chemical, and so most of the time they're on mechanical prophylaxis until they've at least demonstrated stability of that bleed um, before you can add in chemical prophylaxis. They are at quite high risk of having um, DVTs and clots uh, from being bed bound. This is another case study that uh, it's based loosely on a patient that we had recently. So this is BB. She's a 40 year old lady. And she was admitted to ICU intubated with an altered conscious state. So she had a past history of hypertension and migraines. So the day of presentation, she had a headache at 7 a.m. She had classic migraineous features. And so she went back to bed and she thought, it's just like my regular migraine. Um, her husband found her vomiting and conf confused by 10 a.m. And at the ambulance was called. She had a seizure that was witnessed by the paramedics. It was two minutes, self-terminating. Um, and was a bit post afterwards, but was maintaining her own airway. And then had a repeat uh, generalised um, tonic-clonic seizure. And after that remained GCS3 with apneas. And so she was intubated in the field by the paramedics, socially home with her husband. So this is her actual CT brain. And so this on the left, you can see here, this is the side of her hemorrhage. She's got intraparenchymal hemorrhage and she's got extension into the intraventricular system. Okay, so this is the anterior horn um, of the ventricles. Uh, they look a bit swollen and you can also see all this blood um, in the subthalcine fissure and then all the way around here. 
a pretty grainy image, but you can also appreciate, I think, that it's pretty tight in there. There's not a lot of space. You don't get any of the um, a good appreciation of the sulci um, of the surface of the brain either in this image. And there is a little bit of midline shift that's locally associated with this bleed. And this darkness just around the bleed probably rec um, represents some early edema. Um, this is just further down um, of the same imaging on the day of presentation, just to show all the extension, um, how, how devastating this bleed was for this patient. So all these patients get angiography as well. So this is CT angiography. So that's looking at the, the circle of Willis um, and the blood vessels um, within the brain. And this image shows a five millimeter um, anterior communicating artery, um, oh, anterior communicating artery aneurysm. It's a small, it looks pretty small there, but that was big enough to cause the damage on the previous page. It's a five millimeter anterior communicating artery aneurysm um, that's bled and resulted in this devastating um, event for this lady. So now you have two problems. You've got blood in the brain and you also have an aberrant blood vessel. You've got an aneurysm that also needs to be treated because that we know that these aneurysms are at high risk of re-bleeding, okay? So what's worse than blood in the brain and the, and the skull, it's more blood. So this is an interval, interval CT brain two days later. Um, what, I, what I'm pointing out here is she's had bilateral insertion of EVD. So she's had external ventricular devices inserted. So that's what this bright spot here is and this bright spot here. And then in the center, you can see one here and one here. And what you can't appreciate from a single slice is that that's the EVD going into the ventricles on either side. And that aim there is to drain um, extra CSF to try and keep the pressure down within the brain. So we might digress and talk a little bit about ICP here. Uh, so what is intracranial pressure and why do we care about it? Well, ICU physicians are often basic, and so we think about our problems in our complex patients in a basic way. It's basic, it's just extra pressure in the skull. And we care about it because we need to prevent secondary brain injury. Okay, so you've got a tight skull, you need to prevent ischemia from um, too much pressure within the brain. So the normal intracranial pressure is less than 15 millimeters of mercury. Um, we talk a lot in ICU about the Munro Kelly doctrine, and that's that the skull is a fixed volume, and that any increase in volume of any of the components within the skull um, necessarily leads to a compensatory decrease of one of the other components. So, what's in there? CSF, about 10%. Um, it's about 150 mils of CSF that's sifting around in the brain, but also down the spinal cord. So 75 mils of that is actually um, within the skull at any given time in a normal person. 10% uh, represents blood, both venous and arterial, and 80% is brain tissue. Okay. And uh, forgive me my basic little diagram down here, but this is the cranial elastance curve. And so this, is, this represents what happens when you change the volume within the skull, what happens to the pressure. We've got a really narrow zone of compensation here. So about 15 millimeters of mercury down here. By the time you hit 20, you've got some focal ischemia. And then look at the, the um, gradient of this curve. The pressure it just um, exponentially increases uh, for a tiny increase in volume. When you've got an intracranial pressure up at 50, you've got a huge problem. Okay, this is devastating. In ICU, if some if the bedside nurse comes and tell you, tells you that the patient has an ICP of 22, you're already instituting manage, management to, to bring that down less than 20. 
So for the visual learners out there, I quite like this. This is obviously not what a skull is like. It's not a tube, it's, um, but it's a, it's a good way to conceive of this. So this is the compensated state, um, as I showed you on that graph earlier, where you probably pushed a little bit of CSF down into the spinal cord, and that's okay. Um, and then you also, of the blood volume in the skull, the first thing that it is pushed out is actually venous volume, not arterial volume, and that intuitively makes sense. So your venous blood vessels have got uh, thin walled structures, readily collapsible um, and very susceptible for to um, collapse under external pressure. And so really that's probably the best thing for the brain um, is you've still got blood flowing in and you've still got brain tissue that's not under too much pressure. But you've got this nasty mass effect here, whatever it is, if it's infection and abscess or blood from an extra, um, from a bleed or a tumor even, doesn't matter what's in there, but it's something that shouldn't be there. And you've got to change the volume of something else within the skull um, to maintain the pressure, a normal pressure. And this is your decompensated state down here. If the pressure continues to rise, um, you really start to compromise the um, arterial volume and, the, um, and have trouble actually with venous drainage from the brain. And you've really maximally compensated here of your CSF. There's not much else that you can get rid of. So if your patient goes to surgery and they drain the blood, um, whether it's a subdural or a subarachnoid, but if they drain the blood, why do you still have intracranial hypertension? So there's a number of mechanisms. You'll have edema. So blood is quite irritable. You'll end up um, with uh, damage to the, um, to the neurons and they'll swell. You'll have impaired CSF flow and you'll have venous outflow tract obstruction. So basically, blood will still go into the brain, but you won't actually be able to drain it out because those venous structures are collapsed. So these images really just show the flow of CSF. So if you remember, so this is a um, an axial, not an axial, um, a sagittal cross section of the brain, and you can see the superior sagittal sinus here. Um, and these are the arachnoid granulations, and they actually resorb CSF. Um, but if you've got blood in there, they get blocked by clotted blood. And so you actually stop being able to um, reabsorb, uh, reabsorb CSF. And so that's one method of your um, compensation. So decreasing the CSF in the brain is compromised and you end up with hydrocephalus. Um, and then this is essentially just showing you the flow of CSF. So CSF is made in the choroid plexus um, within the ventricular system. So particularly the third and fourth ventricles. Um, and then it flows around the cerebellum, around the brain, and then down the spinal cord as well. And your brain turns over about 500 mils of CSF a day. So you, that's what your choroid, choroid plexus is making as a part of a plasma ultrafiltrate. So how can we measure ICP? Well, in ICU, we don't put the ICP monitors in. The neurosurgeons do. We rely on our neurosurgical colleagues for that. The two commonest kinds that we use are intraventricular and intraparenchymal. Um, I have seen subdural bolts we do see, and I have never seen an epidural um, uh, drain. So I would just ignore that completely. But it, I mean, theoretically, if the skull, if I'm telling you that the skull is a fixed volume, then you, um, it doesn't really matter where you put the device within that skull, um, you will still be able to transduce the pressure. So these are the two different kinds. An intraventricular um, drain, so the EVD that I was talking about, so external ventricular drain goes into the ventricles it has the benefit of being able to drain CSF. So it's both diagnostic, it will transduce a pressure within the skull, but it's also therapeutic. So you can drain CSF if there is high pressure in the skull as a temporizing measure in order to bring that um, pressure down. So it, it's a bit bigger than the intraparenchymal drain and it is an infection risk, actually a greater infection risk than an intraparenchymal um, monitor. 
uh, but that's commonly what you would end up with in a patient that uh, the neurosurgeons are worried about hydrocephalus and increased pressure. An intraparenchymal uh, monitor is essentially just a fiber optic tube that sits just in the um, superficial um, brain tissue and will just transduce an ICP. So it's not therapeutic as well as diagnostic. It's just diagnostic and it will tell you what the pressure is. Um, and it's smaller, less likely to cause trauma, less likely to cause infection, though it is still an infection risk. And then you've got any time you've got anything in the brain from the outside communicating, that's an infection risk. So back to our case. So this lady, after her brain scans in the emergency department, went straight to the operating theatre and had EVDs inserted both sides. Um, and then, as commonly happens in a neurosurgical centre, they went to DSA for coiling of the aneurysm. So as I said to you earlier, there are two issues. One is pressure from all the blood in the brain. Um, and the other is the ongoing potential site of active bleeding, and that's the aneurysm. So DSA means digital subtraction angiography, and that's an, uh, an interventional radiology procedure whereby they put um, a series of catheters uh, into the um, arterial system, usually from the, uh, there you go, femorally. Um, and they put a bunch of coils where that little irregular aneurysm was. Sometimes if they can't reach the, um, reach the aneurysm uh, for anatomical reasons, or particularly in the posterior circulation, for example, they might not have any other choice but to clip. Um, and so clipping is a neurosurgical procedure which involves actually going into the brain and putting a clip around the base of the aneurysm. So it's far more invasive than having um, interventional radiology do a coiling procedure. And so as these patients do, they come back to ICU and they're intubated. Um, and they've had an anaesthetic and they continue the anaesthetic um, in ICU and then we continue to manage them from there. So this is an actual stock image from the internet. This is what your um, external ventricular drain looks like. So this is the drain coming from the patient, all right, um, all the way up here. And then it's draining into the burette. Um, we usually leave this closed and then every hour measure what's being caught here. Um, and then it collects in the bag, which has changed when it's full, or typically within every 24 hours. This here is the pressure manometer. And so it's set here very low in this picture, but that's at four centimetres of water. Um, so they're typically set at you know, 10 to 15 centimetres um, of water uh, for drainage. As you can see, this one's really bloody. When they're this bloody, um, they get blocked. And so the, the only way you can deal with that is you can unblock it with outer plays. So clot busting, uh, we would never do that. That's the neurosurgeons come by and, and they will unblock the drain for you in a sterile fashion. Um, or you have to replace them. Sometimes they're not salvageable and they have to be replaced. And so patients will go back to theatre for an EVD change. Um, they're also transduced and the pressure is read every hour um, as well as being drained. So how can we manipulate ICP? Well, we've already talked about CSF. So you can reduce the volume of CSF. You can reduce the volume of blood. You can reduce the volume of tissue and you can remove bone, okay? Like I said, with basic people in ICU, you have to think, Basically, what can I do to bring this ICP down? And of course, you remove the cause of the extra mass in the first place, if you can. So manipulation of cerebral blood flow, this seems really obvious and simple and basic, but simple maneuvers are sometimes the things that you just have to start with. So that means you, we keep our patients at 30 degrees head of bed to facilitate venous drainage. We avoid any lines and devices that can obstruct venous drainage. So this is the venous drainage system. Um, and you can see that's coming um, down here from the internal jugular vein. So draining from the sinuses uh, within the brain and coming out. 
So typically we would like to, it doesn't always happen, avoid an um, internal jugular central venous line because they are prone to thrombosis. There's not, it is a non-zero risk of thrombosis, which will obviously impair venous drainage on one side. And you really sometimes you don't know um, what the anatomy of that patient is, whether, whether they've only got one good um, internal jugular vein that you're potentially blocking with a thrombosed catheter. Um, trauma patients will come in with a C-spine collar on. And so if they've got raised intracranial pressure, you would take your C-spine collar off and maintain spinal precautions with sandbags. Um, so often in ICU, that means towels rolled and taped to the patient's head. Um, and um, that's one of the most basic things that you can do. You can do that in the emergency department. Um, you can do it anywhere to reduce um, uh, pressure buildup. You can manipulate cerebral blood flow. So um, arterial inflow into the brain is actually um, is metabolism dependent. So the higher your cerebral metabolism, the higher your blood flow. This graph here just shows the determinants of cerebral blood flow. And so that's the mean arterial pressure here. So this is the mean arterial pressure autoregulation curve. It should be familiar from kidneys when you're learning about autoregulation in the kidneys. It's similar for the brain. The range is just different. It's 60 to 160 or 50 to 150, whatever textbook you're reading. Um, uh, so that's the range at which blood flow is autoregulated. And then above this, um, a small increase in pressure will uh, will result in a fairly large increase in cerebral blood flow. And the same goes at the other end of the curve. Um, your partial pressure of oxygen in the blood really doesn't play a role until it's quite low. So when your PO2 is less than 50, then you get this massive vasodilation trying to, where the brain is trying desperately to get more oxygen supply to the brain. And then the CO2 curve is something that we um, spend quite a lot of time worrying about because you can see over this narrow range, it's quite an exponential increase in cerebral blood flow um, into the brain with an increase in CO2 even greater than 45 um, millimetres of mercury. And so we would always target a CO2 of low normal um, in these patients. So how can you reduce the cerebral blood flow? Well, avoid fever. You've got a 6% increase in your cerebral metabolic uh, rate of oxygen consumption for every one degree Celsius increase in temperature. So paracetamol doesn't really work. It's not that effective, but you can do um, temperature management with various other devices, simple things, exposing the patient just in the gown. Um, you can do ice packs to the groin and the axillae. Um, and there are cooling devices that we have available in ICU, which are just giant pads with cool water. But the patient would have to be really hot and have very high ICPs for us to do that. Um, as I said earlier, mild hypocapnia, keep that carbon dioxide level low. If it's too low, you'll vasoconstrict and cause ischemia. You just really want it at the lower end of normal. That's typically 32 to 38 if we're getting pedantic. All these things are extrapolated from some pretty um, I guess it's a not robust level one quality evidence, but it's the best that we have. And it's usually, it's from the trauma foundation, uh, brain trauma foundation guidelines that this is all based on. In ICU, uh, because we have all the toys and the machines, we would intubate them, sedate them, make sure they've got good analgesia on board. So we're talking an IV opiate infusion, so fentanyl or morphine. And you would paralyze the patient. Um, coughing on the tube, for example, will cause massive spikes in ICP. Um, so any, any of the sedative agents that we use, for example, so midazolam or propofol will reduce the cerebral metabolic oxygen demand as well. And then you can put them in a deep barbiturate coma. So I'm talking about thiopentone or uh, phenobarbital really to really slow down um, any uh, brain function and cerebral blood flow. Tissue, other things that we can do, you can shrink the brain tissue. So there's a couple of methods. Um, so you can give mannitol. So that's an osmotic diuretic. It's basically just 
large osmotically active particles in the bloodstream that create an osmotic gradient across the blood, uh, blood brain barrier that sucks fluid from the brain tissue out into the blood vessels. Um, the other alternative is hypertonic saline, so 3% or 23.4% saline. So remembering that usually on the ward you're using 0.9% saline, so you've got to be really careful of how you're dosing this. I'm talking like 20 mils of 23.4% normal saline or 100 to 150 mils of hypertonic saline if it's 3%. So quite small volumes increase the sodium in the blood to reduce the, um, to cause an osmotic shift again across the blood brain barrier. There's risks and benefits uh, to both. I think a lot of people these days use hypertonic saline. There's concern that if you've got a disrupted blood, blood brain barrier, for example, um, particularly in traumatic brain injury, potentially if the mannitol itself crosses the barrier, then maybe you end up with, you don't get such a good osmotic shift. And in fact, maybe you run the risk of drawing um, fluid into the brain. This is not a picture of an EVD. Um, and so as we've talked about, you can drain the CSF. Pharmacological management of um, alteration, alteration of CSF is not appropriate in ICU. It's not an acute intervention, but you can, for example, use acetazolamide in conditions of like benign intracranial hypertension. So ward-based ambulatory care, you can, you can actually manipulate how much CSF the body makes on a daily basis. But in ICU, we don't have the time. Um, we can't rely on that effect. And so we would just drain it with this EVD. So it's a bit easier to see here. You always have this, you're always measuring the pressure from the, the tragus of the ear. So you will actually see these spirit levels in ICU. So attached to the, um, the EVD device and the nurses will always make sure that it's checked against the angle, uh, the, the tragus of the ear, sorry. Um, draining at whatever level is recommended by our neurosurgical colleagues. If uh, they're worried about a blocked, um, drain or the pressures are really high, you would just, you would drop this drain down to zero and try and drain off some CSF quickly um, and then put it back to the level that it was at before. So why do we care about the pressure in the brain? Well, we use it to, um, as a surrogate for cerebral perfusion pressure. And your CPP is your mean arterial pressure. So the pressure of the blood going into the fixed space minus the pressure within the space, the ICP. And the normal is about 60 to 70 millimetres of mercury and we use pressure as a surrogate for flow. And as I keep saying and will keep saying, this, the goal is to prevent secondary brain injury. These patients in ICU have, um, I, they've already sustained a significant brain injury. We provide them time in order to work out how bad that brain injury is um, and um, treatment to prevent secondary brain injury. Something that I haven't talked about because it's a really, it's something that is a topic in and of itself is, is delayed cerebral injury or vasospasm as they used to call it in, in subarachnoid hemorrhage. And, and that's really um, constriction of the arterial vessels within the brain because they're irritated by all the extra um, uh, blood that's in, in the parenchyma where it's not meant to be. And then so these people have had a devastated hemorrhage, devastating hemorrhage, and then they end up with ischemic strokes um, from spasm. So our treatment is, is tailored at preventing secondary brain injury. So if you've got a patient in ICU and you've done all these things, you've optimised their position, they're 30 degrees head up, there's nothing in their neck that's preventing the venous drainage. They've got normal oxygen. They've got a low normal carbon dioxide level. You've given them maximum osmotherapy. So the maximum osmotherapy is targeting a sodium of about 155, so mild hyponatremia, okay? Um, they're intubated, they've got, you've sedated them, they're on, a, they're on an opiate infusion, they're also paralyzed, and you've got that EVD open and you're draining CSF and you know it's patent because you can see it oscillating now, so you can see the CSF draining out. What do you do now? Your ICPs are still 30. Well, there's not much more I can do, but my neurosurgical colleagues 
have, I guess, one more option, and that's a decompressive craniectomy. Um, this is a big deal. It's not appropriate for every, um, every intracranial hemorrhage with raised intracranial pressure. Um, and it's really something that needs to be discussed well with the family um, because what we know of decompressive craniectomy in the limited study, in the studies that we do have is that there's very narrow indication for it, it like very specific stroke syndromes um, and that these procedures are often life-saving um, but sometimes may not provide um, a good quality of life for the patients afterwards. Now that's not always the case, but often. Um, so just to finish, this, this patient's obviously had a very large bleed. Um, it's pretty superficial. So the surgeons have elected to drain it. There's some raised ICP in here. So they also have gone and done, this is called a bifrontal decompressive craniectomy where they take off the frontal bones. And it's basically just to allow the brain space to swell and then over a period of six to eight weeks or longer even um, when there's when the swelling is all subsided the bone flap gets put back on so it needs to get stored in a fridge in theater until that time um, and so that is is really at the discretion of our neurosurgical colleagues um, and is really the last ditch effort All right, I ran a little bit over time and I think that was probably a bit of a potted tour. Some of it was probably um, a bit basic. Some of it was pretty dense. Um, some of it was specifically ICU and it certainly by no means um, covers all of the things that we do in ICU with um, intracranial hemorrhage and all of the management. But I hope it gives you um, a bit more of an idea of, of, of how to manage some of the complications um, in intracranial hemorrhage. Happy to take any questions. Oh, Laura, that was really fantastic. Thank you. Especially like seeing those initial presentations in the emergency department. This is really like sort of knowing where the end goal is, is, is really helpful. So thank you Good. so much. I really appreciate it. Very comprehensive. Um, if anybody would like to unmute and ask a question, please feel free. Otherwise, we might just read through some of these questions. I think you've probably answered some of them um, throughout the sure. talk coming through, so they might be already answered. Um, but I think one of the first ones that I saw that was probably um, pretty useful is, um, do you give prophylactic medaz or anti-epileptics following uh, intracranial hemorrhage in the ICU? Um, no. So... Um... It depends what the hemorrhage is. So I think I said, um, so if a patient comes in with a subdural that needs evacuating, the patient will go to theatre, have it evacuated, and they might be appropriate for extubation. They get extubated in recovery in theatre and they go to the ward and I'm never involved. Um, the patients that we get in ICU are the patients that have, um, they're at risk of re-bleeding or high intracranial pressure or their conscious state precludes taking a tube out. So in, in ICU, our, our rule of thumb is um, GCS less than eight intubate. Um, so they might not have um, a GCS that you're confident with them protecting their airway. Um, so we will run them on sedative infusions, obviously because they, um, they are intubated. Propofol is um, an anesthetic agent that will um, treat seizures as well. So propofol is, is classically our sedative of choice. We will add midazolam if there is um, if there are evidence of seizures that we're not controlling. In regards to prophylactic antiepileptics, um, not everyone gets prophylactic antiepileptics. It really depends on the mechanism um, and the risk factors involved, and we're guided by the neurosurgeons about that. Anyone that's already had um, a seizure as part of their presentation will definitely get antiepileptics, and it's classically levetiracetam. Kepra is what we, Kepra as you know it as. Hope that answers the question. I think so. Thank you so much. Um, the next one, I think uh, when you were first talking about the very start of the, uh, the topic, someone sent this through um, about what causes a raised, uh, sorry, what causes polyuria in um, raised ICP. And I think that goes back to your physiology. 
Yeah, so this is a complex physiological pathway and my basic ICU brain is going to say that you squish the pituitary. <laughs> and so you end up with all kinds of pituitary problems and you end up with um, a failure of antidiuretic hormone. So you are, you're failing to release antidiuretic hormone. Um, and so you're not retaining water, you're just wasting water. Um, so you get aquaresis, which is loss of free water, and you've still got sodium there. Okay. That's a basic way to think about it. I like that. Simple. <laughs> um, uh, there's another question on here about, um, sorry, guys, we're just in the interest of time. I'm not sure we're actually going to get through all the questions, um, but I think Laura's actually gone through and answered a lot of them as they've been trickling in. Um, but well, someone's asked the question about, CT angiogram of the brain um, and mm -hmm. when it's indicated. So if you see a bleed, do you need a CT angio? Uh, yes. And so when a patient comes in, they typically, typically come in as a code stroke, stroke call. And so that triggers a, um, a set series of uh, responses in the emergency department. You can call a code stroke on the ward as well if, if this happens on the ward. Um, and you order a CT stroke series. If you're not sure, call your friendly radiologist, but that is typically a plain CT brain and um, a CT angio. If, a patient, if you're putting a patient through the scanner because they've dropped their GCS on the ward, I would not routinely do a CT angio. You would do a CT plain study to see um, if, there is a, if there is a bleed or if there is any new pathology. Um, a CT angio is, um, is really uh, going to show you if there's a clot in an ischemic, um, and where it is um, in an ischemic stroke or if there's an aneurysm, for example. So you don't routinely need one in everyone that's just had a simple, a simple parenchymal hemorrhage. I think that makes sense as well. Like you don't wanna be wasting resources on those sorts of things if, if they're not indicated. Um, yeah, and, you know, contrast, you need to think about the contrast load that you're giving your patients as well. So they don't all need contrast. Oh, absolutely. Um, I think there's another question about who sets the blood pressure targets as well after a um, intracranial hemorrhage. You know, is it is it the neurosurgeons who's setting it? Is it ICU? Is it the medical team who's sort of setting those blood pressure targets? Um, I mean, we set them in ICU. We are guided by our neurosurgical colleagues. So, patient who has a subarachnoid hemorrhage and if they if they haven't been secured so if they've just had evds put in and they're too unstable for whatever reason to go and have the coiling or the clipping that we talked about they might come to icu first for stabilization in which case you have to have a very tight control of blood pressure usually 120 so it's not too low to 140 so you prevent further re-bleed once that that um, aneurysm has been dealt with and it's secured we move on to what we call the secured protocol and that usually means it doesn't really matter what the blood pressure is anymore as long as it's less than like 200 um, for example because remember the brain has to auto regulate still so there's usually a policy in the hospital that is pretty clear so that everyone um, has a standard of care but the neurosurgeons will be quite specific as they have specific requirements for um, each case. Absolutely. It sounds, again, in this sort of situa situation, it's very multidisciplinary and lots of team input is what Absolutely. I'm hearing. Um, unless anybody has any burning questions that they want to unmute and ask, I think we might um, finish up with this question. Uh, they said, thank you for the presentation, Laura. Um, and were the seizures in the first case of presentation related to the eclampsia or the brain bleed? Good, good question. It's probably, it's chicken and the egg. So mm -hmm. the patient certainly had um, hemorrhage from eclampsia and um, DIC, if you, but it could very well have been the um, eclampsia itself. So once they've had a seizure, it goes from preeclampsia to eclampsia. Um, but it was, um, that once they've had the bleed, they're at increased risk of seizures, I guess, but um, I would say it was probably the eclampsia, but who can tell? I would say it's probably the eclampsia because the hemorrhage, she did not come in with the hemorrhage. The hemorrhage was a um, the secondary to the eclampsia itself. And as you explained, when you're going through the management, that your management's still gonna probably remain much the same, despite what's driving it, it's still gonna remain the same. Yeah. Oh. 
again, if anybody has anything they really, really want to ask, feel free to unmute, but we might just leave it there, I think, um, for the minute. There's lots of questions coming in, but um, a little bit sidetracked. And I think we could end up talking about chest x-rays and everything like that um, in the meantime.